my announcement. Um, we will love to open it up to the community. And so um, I really wanted to hold signs out on the road saying, baptism this way <laughs> for anyone who would want to get baptized. Um, but instead, we're going to kind of advertise it uh, via Nextdoor and Facebook and opening it up to the neighborhood, friends and family. We actually got a grant from Thrivent that provided the food for us. So don't worry about over-inviting, okay? Um, we want this to be just a time of, like Matt said, proclamation and exposing people to Jesus. So, um, so yeah, you, you want to be here for that Sunday. So <clears throat> Matt and I were discussing the other day um, about how different it is, how different of a job it is uh, to be a pastor. You know, like when you step into or start a new job, if you're like me, it takes a couple of weeks. You know, you have a, a kind of like a sharp learning curve. And then, um, you know, those days and those first days, you come home and you kind of go through everything in your mind. And you look back over your day like, did I do this right? Did I say this right? Maybe I should watch my coworker next time to learn to do it better. And um, in, in a typical job, probably maybe not so much with the jobs that have variables like police officers or EMTs, but in a typical nine to five job, uh, you have somewhat of a learning curve. And then as the months progress, you kind of get better, you get more efficient, right? And we were talking about how it is to be a pastor, and at least we haven't quite grasped that learning curve yet. It keeps curving and curving and curving and curving. And uh, it really hasn't happened for us yet where we feel like, oh, we, we have a really good grasp on this. You know, we settle into our rhythms and that, um, and take a breath when we need to take a breath, rest when we need to rest. But there's always something new, like every single week. And I feel like that's discipleship as well in our relationship with the Lord. Um, and, you know, we wish that there was like a handbook, a get from a, point A to point B handbook for, a, you know, to pastor a little church in Omaha, Nebraska, or to um, the everyday uh, ins and outs of living in Omaha, Nebraska with a small family, uh, but there isn't, you know, there isn't, uh, you have scripture, but it's, it's rarely like, okay, you're here, and now you're going to get here, and it's a straight line, right? And as I was bringing up um, some Bible maps and stuff, I looked, wow, Jesus, in, in all the areas that he visited, he was pretty curvy. <laughs> his, his ways were kind of like, it's seemingly all over the place. They didn't make sense. Um, and that's kind of what discipleship is like. When we, uh, when, as we're going through Mark here, uh, we see that the disciples uh, step into one learning curve, then another learning curve, and another learning curve, and another learning curve. And it doesn't quite stop curving. Um, regardless of all of the variables, though, Jesus himself is the one constant, and he himself is the peace. So as we go through Mark, we kind of get a glimpse, uh, you know, we, through scripture, get a glimpse of what the disciples' learning curve was like. Um, but like any good story and any good Sunday school teacher, right, we're going we, to, we're going to set the, set the groundwork here. And so with some, with some visuals, by the way, did everybody get a picture of Rembrandt's thing when you came in? Did you guys get it? Matt'll just stick your hand up if you didn't. Matt will get you. So in this story, in Mark chapter four, we're gonna hang out there. Uh, we're we're in the sea. It's in the Sea of Galilee, uh, in Capernaum, which is the northern. Go back one slide. There we go. You see up there. It's in the north end of the sea in Capernaum. And this is where Jesus, uh, as Matt said last week, was preaching all day long. The crowds were pressed in against him. So he actually set out a little ways in a boat and used the boat as his pulpit, which I think is really awesome. I would love someday to use a boat as my pulpit. Um, and <clears throat> he set out there because the crowds were all pressing in against him and he 
uh, preached and ministered all day long. And it's in this place where uh, they were able to be heard because it was kind of like an amphitheater style, the way that the mountains curved in. And, and so out on the water, it kind of echoed, right, so everybody can hear him. <clears throat> so as we start this story, he's still in the boat after a long day of preaching, and he's on the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is about 8 miles wide and about 13 miles long. And Capernaum is at the north end there, and they were headed to the country of the Gerasenes. And so there is, there's a little, um, we don't know for sure quite what that means, because sometimes in Scripture it would say, okay, this area or a whole region was named one thing or after a specific city. So I could confidently say it was south <laughs> from where they were at, all right? And so um, most scholars believe that it is completely south um, on that somewhere underneath Kersey, between Kersey and Gadara there on the right-hand side. So they had to go quite a ways. Um, <clears throat> And then, uh, then you have the boat, and so, and we were actually talking about this the other night after prayer meeting, that um, Mary actually had seen a boat that was ex excavated uh, in 1986, uh, around the time of Christ. It wasn't, they call it the Jesus boat, but, you know, it probably more likely wasn't the boat that Jesus was in, but it was very similar to the boat they had in that time. So they had, um, they created a replica and a model of it. And this is kind of the boat. It, it fits about 15 grown men in it. And so the picture, or what's closest to us, is the stern of the boat. So this is the part where Jesus takes a snooze in, right? And if you notice, that's also where the rudders are. That's where the captain sits. And so keep that in mind as we go through and read through this passage. <clears throat> Um, so we pick up the point where Matt left off last week in Mark 4, and he's just finished preaching. He preached on the parables of the mustard seed and the seeds and faith. And um, so then uh, the disciples are starting to grasp, or are supposed to grasp these kingdom concepts, right? But in private, he explained a lot to them. Um, so we're going to start out reading in Mark 4:35. And I want you to envision yourself on the boat with Jesus and his disciples. You could read along or you can look at your picture from Rembrandt. But, or if, you, if it helps, close your eyes if it helps you focus better. But I want you to picture in your mind what it would feel like to be in that boat. What would it smell like? What words or phrases are highlighted to you? And what do you sense the Lord telling you through this passage. And I'm going to read it in the NRSV. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him. So as we read through that passage, what are some, you guys going to help me write the sermon here, what are some words and phrases that stuck out to you? Yeah, the disciples questioning, don't you care? <laughs> then no faith? Is that what you yeah. Mm-hmm. 
be still. Yeah, so almost every time I do this exercise with our group or directee, uh, with Rembrandt's photo here, um, I am almost always, or I envision myself always, the one puking over the side of the boat. <laughs> if you see a guy there, he's about ready to lose his lunch, right? So <laughs> that's usually me. And it's usually Jesus comes and holds my hair back and he's patting my back. There, there. It's okay. There, there. That's usually uh, where I'm at in the boat. <clears throat> but let's unpack this a little bit. What does uh, discipleship and being a disciple of Jesus look like in this scenario? There are a ton of lessons that could be pulled from this, but we're going to focus on just a few of them as we look at the contrast in the disciples' learning curve. <clears throat> the first one is trust. So after a long day of ministering to the crowds and preaching from the boat, he turns to his disciples and he says, let us go to the other side. It was getting dark. They probably couldn't see much, although no doubt uh, they probably fish quite often at night. <clears throat> um, but they didn't stop to grab extra clothes or food. They just set sail uh, just as he was preaching from the boat. Because if they went to shore again, they would have to deal with all the crowds. And um, so they set out for open water. And if you notice, like throughout all of scriptures, Jesus was always telling his disciples to travel lightly, right? Don't take the extra cloak. Don't take the extra money. Travel lightly. And here's one of the first examples of Jesus doing that exactly himself, right? Um, of course, after a long day of ministry, he's exhausted, he conks out for a nap, a windstorm whips up, and I found it really interesting that roughly in the same place where the word of God is amplified, heavy storms can brew without a moment's notice. And I was thinking, why then do I get so surprised when I encounter in the midst of the areas where his word seems to be going out powerfully, reverberating, echoing, reaching the hearts of friends, families, neighbors, co-workers. Why am I surprised when heavy windstorms kick up, when there's opposition, when there's wind resistance? Uh, sometimes it's the enemy, sometimes it's in my head, uh, but when breakthrough starts to happen, and we're faced with resistance, do we engage and get sucked into the frenetic chaos of it all, or are we a people of peace? Which leads me to number two, a per being a person of peace. Up to this point, they knew Jesus as a man mostly, that mostly took action, right? And occasionally he went missing to spend time with the Father in prayer. And they witnessed him performing miracles, so they knew that he had on some level an authority. Yet here he was, asleep as the boat was drowning, and in the stern, nonetheless, the place where the captain sleeps and steers the, sh or steers the ship. Uh, Jesus was a man of action, but he was also very much a man that was at peace and calm. The third one is faith. And honestly, as I read through this, I felt a little bit sorry for the disciples. And I can't help to wonder, well, what would faith look like in this scenario? To not bail out the water as the ship is going down? Would that be faith? I mean, it was literally going down. It was rising and overwhelming the boat. Would it look like to take a nap with Jesus as all this was going on? Or to get out and walk on the water? Like, what would faith look like? And I know that we would like to think that we would have responded differently than a group of fishermen who was very well trained in this exact scenario. Uh, but I don't know. Like, it wasn't it, it, to me, I was like, wasn't it enough faith? that they woke up Jesus. I mean, there's that, right? There's that. 
But it wasn't their lack of, it wasn't, their lack of faith was not uh, questioning Jesus or, or waking him up. Because I believe the Lord welcomes our questions. It was the type of, reflect, of question that reflected a deeper heart issue that required a paradigm shift. Is what Felicity had mentioned. Teacher, do you not care? Do you not care? Now, if you've ever been on the receiving end of this question and your good and loving intentions have ever been misunderstood, especially after pouring your heart and soul into something, you know that accusations like this can cut really deep, right? And we've all been there. We've all probably been on the receiving end of that question. Don't you care? If I were Jesus, and this is probably a very good reason why I'm not, <laughs> but if I were Jesus, my response would be, if I didn't care, I wouldn't be here. Like, I wouldn't be here with you. They could have asked pretty much any other question, and it would have exhibited some level of faith. Just a mustard seed's worth. Like, they just learned hours earlier. They could have asked hey, you said we we're going to the, you know, we're going to get to the other side. How do you propose we do that on a sinking boat? <laughs> they could have asked, hey, can you do that miracle thing that you've done with people, but, you know, with the sea and, like, dip your finger in the water or something? They could have asked anything. Anything. But they woke up the one who left heaven for them, lived his whole life for them, gave up everything for them and will die for them and ask them, do you not care? Sit with that for a second. This is the question that continues to ring throughout humanity's existence, right? When we or others feel opposition or when the storms of life come and the waves get huge and overwhelming and we're in over our head and have no idea how we're going to make it out to the other side and he feels distant, Somehow, in the midst of all that, we forget and we question his love for us. He doesn't meet our anxiety, however, with the same level of chaotic energy. Instead, he is simply present with us in the boat. Some people say that the opposite of fear is faith. And I think that's partly true. But more than that, what casts out fear completely? What does the scripture say? Perfect love. Perfect love. So when Jesus asks them a question, then Jesus asks him a question of his own afterwards. He doesn't respond, right? He doesn't respond to the chaos. He just says, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? He's saying, when he asks that question, he's saying, don't you trust that I am who I say I am and I'll do what I'll say I'll do. That I'm God himself, perfect love, right beside you in the flesh. Notice uh, that he doesn't say a word <clears throat> before that. He just simply rebukes the wind and the sea, saying, peace, be still. And something tells me these words were not just for the wind and sea, right? But also for the hearts of the disciples and, and for us today. And so here we get another glimpse into discipleship, which is authority, number four. Jewish people grew up reading that God controlled the winds and the waves. They knew that the Lord was Lord and had authority over the sea, uh, several verses in Psalms say that. But they did not expect, it to, to expect to see it out of a human being sitting right beside them, napping, right? And after this whole encounter, we see the disciples in awe and finally asking a question that makes sense, finally asking the right question with awe and wonder, who is this? Who is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. Notice their paradigm is beginning this shift, right? I feel that the Lord delights in this question so much. 
so much. Because we, if we spend our entire lives asking only one question of him, and it's steeped in awe and wonder, I feel that this would be it. Lord, who are you? Who are you? I want to know you. Because it's from that heart posture that you can only grow in relationship with him and he with you. We could rest in the fact that he says, I am who I say I am. We'll talk a little bit more about authority in this next section with the story of the garrison, but we're going to go ahead and read uh, Mark 5. They came to the other side of the sea to the region of the Gerasenes. And when he had stepped out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. He lived among the tombs, and no one could restrain him any more, even with a chain. For he had often been restrained with shackles and chains, but the chains were he wrenched apart, and the shackles he broke in pieces. And no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always howling and bruising himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed down before him, and he shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he had said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. He begged him earnestly not to send them out of the region. Now there on the hillside of a great uh, now there on the hillside a great herd of swine was feeding, and the unclean spirits begged him, Send us into the swine, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine, and the herd, numbering about two thousand, stampeded down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. The swine herds ran off and told it in the city and in the country. The people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the man possessed by demons sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, the very man who had had the legion, and they became frightened. Those who had seen what had happened to the man possessed by demons and to the swine reported it. Then they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed by demons begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus refused and said to him, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. And he went away and began to proclaim to, in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed. So if in this uh, last story, uh, in the last story Jesus was declaring through signs and wonders, I am who I say I am. But in this story, he's declaring that plus you are who I say you are. Jesus and the disciples get to the other side after the storm. Uh, we have our map again. So they're in this area uh, between Gergesa and Gadara somewhere. Um History tells us that in that area and in that territory, there was a lot of violence and bloodshed that had happened uh, due to the hostile takeovers and political unrest. Uh, people there worship multiple gods. You were in the thick of Gentile territory, right? Uh, a, and honestly, a bunch of Jewish men probably had no business being there at all because it was so opposite from the lifestyle that they were used to. Um, so people also worship multiple gods. They practice magic, uh, spirit divination. And often the tombs were one of those places where these practices would happen. Uh, Isaiah, in Isaiah 65, it refers to that, like, uh, why are you roaming the tombs, Israel? It was, it was very symbolic. But to say that this guy, and I wish we knew his name by the end of the story, because he's going forever down as the demoniac of, you know, the Gerasene demoniac, right? But that's not who he is anymore. So I kind of wish that the Lord would have given us his name at the end of it. But to say that this guy was in the thick of it was a vast understatement. He was known as the town crazy person, basically. Everyone knew him. Everyone heard him. Everyone tried to contain him. 
in their eyes, he was a worthless cause, too far gone. Uh, the Gentiles wouldn't even go near him, let alone Jewish people. Everything about him was unclean, absolutely everything. But Jesus, but Jesus. Jesus says, you're worthy, worth more, not worth less. Jesus, being absolutely exhausted, faring a storm, traveled across the sea seemingly for one man. One man. <coughs> he didn't have a revival on the other side. He went and talked to one man. A man who, by the way, saw Jesus coming and ran towards him and bowed down before him. And it's unclear if it was the man himself or the demons within him, right? We're not really clear on that. Uh, but we do know that they were absolutely aware of Jesus' worth and authority. Even the disciples in the previous story didn't acknowledge that right away. Isn't that interesting? The second thing that Jesus does here is to command the unclean spirits to come out of him and declare through a sign and wonder that the garrison man is free and clean. He cast the demons out into a herd of pigs, which in Jewish culture, pigs were considered very unclean. I believe he did this for a number of reasons, but mainly it was a massive demonstration of God's power that the entire town heard about. Not only that, but it shined a light on the very real and very destructive forces of the enemy. He takes no greater pleasure than to steal, kill, and destroy. After this powerful demonstration, the townspeople came to see the man sitting there with Jesus, clothed and of a sound mind. He was not only clothed literally, but when he encountered Jesus, he was no longer naked and ashamed spiritually. Like the scriptures say, when we acknowledge Jesus as our Savior, our Deliverer, our Healer, our Redeemer, he was clothed in salvation. He was clothed in gladness, robed in righteousness, clothed in dignity, honor, and majesty. No longer tormented by a spirit of love, or by a spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of a sound mind. And here's the thing. He did it then, and he does it now. He does it now. He longs to come into those places in us and in the ones we love, the ones we encounter, where there is shame and nakedness and bondage, those places that keep us wallowing in the muck and mire, and with one spoken word, breaks the chains and sets us free. He goes through such great lengths to get to us and to clothe us in these things. Do we run away or do we run towards Lastly, we see that he appointed the man a person, as a person of peace. A person of peace is a, is a person that opens the way for the gospel to enter one's social group or village. And later, when he sends the disciples out to minister, he tells them to go look for the person of peace upon entering a town or village and stay with them. Because wherever Jesus went... He was always looking and searching for that person of peace. And in this case, he traveled across the sea, found him, delivered him from demons. As one could expect, after such a dramatic encounter and conversion, the garrison man begged to go with Jesus. Who wouldn't, right? Who wouldn't, after confronting such power, feeling so free? But Jesus told him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown to you. And 
And it never really struck me before. But man, when I read this part, I just wept. I wept. Because he had a home. He had friends. Sometimes we think that people are too far gone that could almost dehumanize them, right? But here Jesus first acknowledges him as a person. It's probably been years, months since that, since he felt that. And he hands him back his humanity by reminding him of his home and his relationships. And then he commissions him. He didn't go through Bible school. <laughs> he didn't go through a 10-step process. He was delivered and he's commissioned. The first missionary to the Gentiles. A whole region. A whole region. And he went away proclaiming how much Jesus had done. And everyone was amazed. That awe and wonder. It spread like wildfire. <clears throat> I just want to talk about a word about authority as we close this morning. <coughs> and we were just talking about this yesterday, about how the giants in our time and day feel so different than maybe what our parents or grandparents went through. <clears throat> and different generations have different giants. It's neither more or less. It's just different. And we're facing some big giants, right? We're facing some really big giants. But our struggle is not with flesh and blood, meaning with people. It's not people because they all have homes. They all have friends. As sons and daughters of the king and co-heirs with him, he has given us authority and, and the power necessary to overcome and set people free. Now, sometimes exercising that authority might look totally different in certain times. Sometimes authority could mean total peace and calm, like sleeping in the stern of the boat. Sometimes it might be, be quiet, come out of him. It's both. It's the laying down of the sword, like Peter and it's taking up arms and fighting. It's the mama bear and papa bear loving and praying for their family and loving on them. And it's the ex-demonized and those healed from mental illness walking back into their hometown and sphere of influence to free the oppressed from generations of territorial spirits. It's both. Authority may look different in different circumstances depending on the situation, but God who is perfect love, casts out fear every time. The tendency can be sometimes to get caught up in the frenetic chaos and noise of the world and think we have to choose a side. If Jesus is in us, his authority is in us. We don't need to be afraid to do what he has called us to do and to step into, step into our culture and the world outside these doors to bring freedom to a world that is so desperate. So desperate. There's no ideology or belief or political stance or laws or words or noise that could ever replace this. The trusting, peace-filled authority that only Jesus himself brings to our lives. It doesn't even come close. Those other things don't even come close. <clears throat> Dan, if you want to go ahead and come up. I want you to go ahead and stand <clears throat> as we close today. He's given us the same authority that he's given Jesus, right? We walk shoulder to shoulder with him as co-heirs. And I just wanted to read Luke 4 again. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. 
He has set me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the 